Good morning. Thank you for your your uh, being here with me this morning. I'm I'm moving. I'll tell you the truth. Okay, I'm I'm I woke up late, jumped in here, um, grabbed my coffee, got my Bible, spent some time in prayer, and here I am. So I, if I stumble a little bit at first, just love me, and it's okay. Because <laughs> I'm tell you what, I ran into this thing, uh, just like what am I supposed to do? So here we are. Good morning for those of you that are watching in the morning. Good afternoon or evening to those others. Glad that you're here. It's it's good to be able to gather together. I'm Mark Driscoll with Prepare the Way Ministries, and uh, our job is to prepare the way. We're here to call people uh, to prepare their hearts and minds uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, two days ago, the whole country just stopped and looked at the sky uh, for an eclipse. Isn't that interesting how that happened? Um, the whole country, um, even if you weren't in the direct path of it, you were looking. Um, and it's interesting. Um, you know, there are times when God gets our attention. And whether you believe that the eclipse had some prophetic meaning, or you just believe it was a really cool, cosmic, you know, scientific wonder, um, it got our attention, didn't it? <laughs> Everybody was looking at it, whether you believe or not, everybody was looking at it. And I'm certainly not interested in, in trying to to uh, make some, you know, creepy kind of predictions. Uh, but I will tell you, that natural thing showed us one thing. There, there's a God. He created all things, and he's running the universe. And uh, if he wants to get our attention, he can do it. And uh, some of the other messages... Um, you know, light always overcomes the darkness. That we watch darkness, which was fleeting, and light is still shining. The darkness has passed, and the sun is still shining. It makes me think of 1 John 2, 8, where it says, For the darkness is fading, but the true light is already shining. Now, that's talking about the gospel of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And the dark kingdom of darkness is fading. Um, the devil's days are numbered. And his kingdom is just being is being dismantled as we speak. Uh, the kingdom of light is shining, and ultimately we will see him. And that's what we're here today. We're here at Prepare the Way to say the light always wins. Um, their light has come into the world, and darkness has not overcome it. And so today in your life, you know the darkness will fail. The darkness has failed. You're in the if you're in Christ, you're in the victory section. You're, and so trust in him. Keep looking to him. Put on your, you know how we had to put on our glasses for the, for the eclipse so we wouldn't get blinded? Christian, you need to put on your gospel glasses when you look at the fading darkness. Otherwise, you're going to be blinded by what you think you see. Now, I'll let you just meditate on that one. Um, but let's pray and get into our message for today. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace for your love. Thank you for your kindness and your faithfulness. Thank you for the truth, Lord, of your word. Thank you that the light has come and we don't we are not subject to the darkness. We we experience it, but we are not overcome by it. And uh, the true light is shining and we focus on the light. We're aware of the dark, but we focus on the light. We thank you, God, for the reality of who you are. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your, your mercy, for the forgiveness that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, as we continue in your word, uh, may your word feed us, change us, challenge us, call us closer and deeper, and may it encourage and assure us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're in First Thessalonians. If you didn't know, we've been going through this wonderful book, uh, where Paul is basically, he, he starts off just recounting uh, that he had some struggles when he first came to Thessalonica. He ended up having to, actually got run out of town by the Jews who were there. And uh, he got run out of town and ended up, uh, but the church had started. And he was really worried, so he sent Silas and Timothy back to Thessalonica to find out how they were doing. They, met, they went to find out, and they came back and brought a message to Paul, who was in the city of Corinth at the time. That's where he wrote this letter from. And they gave him a good report, that the church was standing strong and moving in faith. 
the darkness had come, but it had not overcome the church in Thessalonica. Paul was rejoicing. And so he's writing this letter partly just to celebrate. He's saying, you know, God did this thing. God brought this about, you know, and he's celebrating. And he spends really, honestly, the first two chapters just having a, a shouting party. He is telling how we know that God began the work in Thessalonica. And, and so you see him doing that. And we've talked about all the different things. You go back and watch previous videos on chapter 1 and 2. We're finishing chapter 2 today, and it has the last part where Paul is saying, this is how we know. And what we've been talking about is, how do you know it's a God thing? How do you know God is at work in something? We have a lot of things happening in, in our midst. Even, well, for example, look at the... Um, Look at the eclipse thing. How many false prophets, and I'm just going to tell, them, tell you what they are. False prophets made some prophet predicting that the rapture was coming or something else was going to happen on the day of the eclipse. And the eclipse has passed and the stuff didn't happen. You know, in the Bible, it's very clear. If a prophet says something and it don't happen, don't listen to them. Now, others said it's a sign of other things, uh, God warning us. Well, you know, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. But the people that said those exact things, and every time we have any kind of unusual thing in our society, there's always people saying, God told me this was going to happen, and then history proves them wrong. You know why we believe the Old Testament prophets? Because history proved them right. History proved them right. And so... But I, I wanted to say this. I'm not interested in beating people up or anything like that. But I just want to say, um, you know, the proof is in the results. The proof is in the activity of God. It, so, and, and that's that's relevant to this chapter because Paul say, look, here's how we know that God did this. Hey, Paul, look what happened. Look at the impact. And so the last part of it, he mentions a couple of other things that show you when God has been at work. Let me read it to you. We're going to be in verses 13 through 16. Um, and it, it, we may finish the whole chapter. I haven't decided yet, but let's just get with it, okay? Verse 13, Paul is still thanking God. He says, we thank God constantly for this. Here's the listen. Here, here's the first thing. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Let me read the rest. I'm going to come back to that because that's fire. Verse 14. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who, bo who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, for wrath has come upon them at last. Uh, so Paul is, is intermingling a couple of things. Number one is that they, they received the word of God as the word of God. And number two... They endured suffering. Uh, they were opposed, but they stood strong in it. And God came to their rescue in the end. Two of the big things that show me God is at work is one is the reality of the preaching of the word of God. Look at verse 14. He says, you received the word, or verse 13, I'm sorry, from us. In other words, he, they received their preaching saying, look, when, you, when we preach to you, you didn't hear it as just a bunch of old men saying things, spouting off their opinion, their perspective. You heard it as it is the word of the living God. The word of the living God. And, and how do we know it was the work of God? Well, at the end of that little phrase, he says, which is at work in you believers. So here's the first thing, that when you hear preaching, you can tell, if you've got any discernment at all, at all, if you're hearing the word of God or the word of man. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the difference between the two. 
the word of man, I'll just say quickly, the word of man today when we listen to preaching or teaching or, or podcasts with biblical content, you want to know the difference. You want to make sure that when you're listening to that, when you're listening to this right here and other things like this, or you go to church or whatever, you're, you're, are you hearing the word of God or are you hearing the word of man? Now, here, the first thing is is that that when, when the word of God is being preached, you need to understand something, that the word of God, the scripture, is not merely the opinion of men and women. The, the, the scripture is not merely a collection of the opinions of people. Paul said all scripture is inspired by God. God breathed. Peter says we didn't follow cleverly devised tales. Uh, that men didn't just write their opinion. No, no, matter, no scripture came out by man's own interpretation. But men of God wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That the word of God, the scripture is not the word of man. It is the word of God. Now, here's the thing. When you are listening to preaching, one of the ways you know if you're hearing the word of God or the word of man is what is the place of the scripture in that preaching? Sometimes people will use a Bible verse as a jump off point. But they don't talk about what it says. They just, well, let me read to you from this scripture. And then let me tell, spend the next 45 minutes telling you what I think about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Um, that's not biblical preaching. That's not the word of God. That's the opinion of man. Biblical preaching puts the scripture in the center of the preaching. Jesus Christ now, the other thing is, is that not only the scripture, because you can preach a Bible verse and miss Jesus altogether. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, to speak, we preach Christ and him crucified. And so to have the word of God, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead, must be the center of, of that preaching. That's the word of God. Second, it must be the scriptural perspective. What is God saying about this circumstance or situation? If I, if I want to preach, for example, about an election that took place or even uh, some cur current event, an eclipse maybe, or something else, I don't ask what do I think about it and then look for a Bible verse to back it up. I ask what does God already say about it? What does God say about that event? What does God say about that issue? For example, the, the issue of morality in our culture today, we've got people preaching their opinions. They'll take a sliver of scripture, and then for the next 40 minutes, they're talking about their own personal feelings and experiences and say, see, I, really, I just really believe God's okay with this. But the scripture itself does not back, back that up. And so when you read the scripture it, and, and Jesus, the, that's central. That's how you know you're hearing the word of God. The other way you know is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit works in the heart when this word of God is being preached. And so it's one thing for me to hear a lecture on morality. It's another to hear the anointed word of God because the anointed word of God will touch my heart. The anointed word of God will get hold of me and it will say something to my heart, not just to my head. Now, I love preaching that, that, that touches the head and the heart. I think it's important to, to make people think, but also to connect at the heart. But preaching that, that has to carry the truth that's from God, God calls us to preach the truth that convicts, encourages, builds up, sometimes tears down. The Word of God is living and active and is able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when, when the word of God is being preached, it, it comes with power. Paul already mentioned that in the very first chapter. He said it not only came to you in word, but also in power. And so Paul says, when you heard the word, you received it, not as the word of man, but as it really is the word of God. Now, the other side of that is the hearer, the burden that's on the hearer. I, I first talked to you about how important it is for the speaker to make sure they're speaking God's word and not their own opinions. The second is on the responsibility of the hearer. When you go to church and your pastor opens up that sacred text, 
and your pastor begins to speak out of that sacred text, you need to be doing a couple of things. You need to be re you need to be opening your heart up um, to hear what God has to say. You need to be asking yourself, asking God, God, would you speak to me right now? A lot of people miss the word of God in church because they're looking at their cell phone, uh, they're they're taking selfies or they're they're sending emails, waiting for the sermon to be over. Um, they are sending texts to each other. Uh, they're watching something else. I don't even know why you're at church. Just stay home. Um, if you're going to play like that, just stay home because that's an insult to God. I want you to understand. Now, I know that sometimes people work in emergency situations and, and you got an emergency and you got to do this thing right here in the right middle of service. That You know, there's grace for that in there, right? But I'm talking about the person who just, they just sit in there taking you know, wasting time sitting there, occupying space, but they ain't listening to God. Other people, they're more interested in the style of the preacher and the length of the sermon than the actual content of what God's trying to say to them. You know, when that preacher, unless you have some compelling reason to doubt it, you need to believe that when your pastor is preaching out of the scripture and you know that they're opening this book and they're reading out of it, and their preaching is grounded in it. And you know it. You can hear it. They're using the text. They're opening up the text. They're not manipulating it. They're not playing pieces of it. They're reading the whole thing. And they're sharing it with you. When they're doing that, you need to assume that God is speaking to you in that moment. You need to assume that. Now, if you have some compelling reason to doubt that, then you need to talk to, to God about it first. And then you need to talk to your pastor about it second. Right, because that that means there's a question, and if you're in a place where there's a question, is this really the word of God I'm hearing? That's worth testing. That's worth looking into. But some people just do that because they don't want to be confronted with the truth. Some people will hear the truth and they'll say, "Oh, that preacher, they're just not. They're just stepping on my toes. They're just they're offending me. They're just not." You know, if you're getting offended by the honest and true and clear preaching of the word of God, the preacher is not the problem. The preacher's not the problem. You're the one with the heart problem. You're the one that's got an issue you don't want to deal with. Some of you listening to me have left churches because the pastor confronted things that you didn't want confronted. And they did it on the basis of God's word. And they said the truth of God's word and you didn't like what you heard. So you decided that that pastor was being judgmental when actually that pastor was just being truthful. They were speaking the truth plainly and they were speaking it in love. Now, if they're not speaking the truth in love, I understand. Uh, I wouldn't listen to somebody that didn't speak the truth in love either. I get that. But you know what? Most pastors, I know a lot of pastors, and uh, I'll tell you what, I think most pastors love the Word of God. They don't get attention. They're not all on stage. They're not all on, you know, big cameras and stuff like that. Most pastors in this country are the unseen heroes who are preaching the Word of God faithfully. They're praying faithfully. They're seeking God faithfully. But people are flocking to the charlatan who just wants to entertain them and tell them what they want to hear. And so, but if you're in a place where you're hearing the scripture preached as the word of God, if that's true, then in worship, you need to be asking God to speak to you. I encourage you to take notes. I encourage you to, to bring a paper and pen or, and just sit there and write down some thoughts. And here's the question, not... Did they use good illustrations? Not, did they tell good jokes? Not, was I entertained? Here's what you ought to write down. This is what God is speaking to me about. Hearing the word of God as it really is. And this is the challenge I think that Paul is saying, look here, the way we know that God was at work is because of the way you received his word. That's what he said. You received it. Not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work. In you believers. Here's the thing about the Word of God. You know how you know you've heard the Word of God? It continues to work in you after you leave church. That's how you know you've heard the Word of God. Because the Word of God has that power. The Word of God is the seed that's planted in the soul. And it might not germinate in that moment. It might take it a couple of days. But that's going to keep working in you. Um, and so, you know, the Lord speaks to us through His Word. And He uses His servants to proclaim that Word. So it's on the responsibility of the servant of God, the preacher, to make sure that they're not preaching their own thoughts and philosophies and ideas, but the Word of God. And they're not trying to water it down so people will like it. 
They're just giving it like it is. And, oh, preacher, in, a, in this day, let's just keep challenging ourselves, shall we? To always be faithful to preach the truth of the Word of God. Preach it in love. Do it the way Jesus did it. But preach it and tell the truth. Preach the Word. Be in season, out of out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching for the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but they will, having itching ears, they will run off to teachers to suit their own desires. But you, be, be keep your head in all situations. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now, here's the thing. Um, God calls us to be faithful with the word. Now, on the other side, listener, listener, when you're, if you're going to go uh, to church if you listen to a sermon, if you're going to listen to a YouTube video or podcast, or if you're going to sit down and read some books that are written by men and women of God, if you're going to do that, make sure, A, that, you're, that what you're hearing is grounded in the Scripture. And I'm, I'm going to say something about that in a minute. And make sure that you're open to the Word of God. The other thing that the Lord has shown me in, in preaching, and I've been preaching 40 years, um, and I've, I've, in the later part of my preaching, I've learned to do this. Um, preaching that's truly biblical. Now, I'm not going to get into style and all that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of styles. Preaching that's truly biblical does not just put all its weight on a fragment of a verse or one verse and then just go off and talk about everything they want to talk about. If I want to find something that's truly biblical, how do I know that the perspective on, for example, drinking is biblical? I don't look for one verse that talks about alcohol. I, what, what does the entire counsel of God say about alcohol? If I'm talking about women preachers, that's a big topic today. Do I uh, read one verse and say, well, there it is, there's your proof? Or do I, what does the whole counsel of God say about women leaders and ministers? Um, if I'm talking about, you know, lots of different things. You know, what does the whole counsel of God say about sexuality? And so what, is that, what does the whole counsel of God say about uh, different kinds of things, music and worship, those, those types of issues? What's the whole counsel? And so if a preacher is going uh, to really preach the Word of God, they need to be able to show that what they're preaching is not just in that one verse, but it has representation in other parts of the scripture. That's just a good sign. Most preachers do that. Most preachers I know do exactly that. And I'm just reminding that's what we need to be doing. And so, <clears throat> not to mean to turn this into a preaching class. I'm just, I, I think it's important that, that people receive the word of God. I think it's important, Paul thought it was important in those days, that they didn't hear it as the opinion of man, but as the word of God. And I think that's important. Now, he goes on to finish this, this part. He says, you became imitators of the churches of God and of Christ Jesus that are in Judea. In other words, true biblical preaching creates disciples. You became imitators of the churches in Judea. He's saying, look here, true biblical preaching, truly hearing the word of God, is going to make people want to follow Jesus. You know, if what I'm doing isn't encouraging people in their faith, if it's not building disciples, if it's not calling people to follow Jesus, then I've got a problem. And I pray that sometimes. I say, Lord, you know, I'm sitting here staring at this screen, and I get some likes and stuff, but I, you know, am I making disciples? Are you being urged to follow him? Because they become imitators of the churches. He didn't say you became imitators of us in this place. He said that earlier, but he said you became imitators of the churches, the larger church, that, that you followed the the direction of God's people. <clears throat> and then it goes on to say, you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. They're saying, you know, the churches in Judea were persecuted by the Jews, and you suffered the same persecution they did. Then he goes on to say, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and they drove us out, and they displeased God and opposed all mankind. So Paul is talking about how the Jews had persecuted the, the Old Testament prophets. They had persecuted the apostles. They had persecuted the Christians in Judea, and they drove everybody out. And it says they oppose all mankind. You know why? Because they're standing in the way of helping mankind hear the gospel. And then it says, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. Uh, in other words, on some level, and I, there's scholars have wrestled with what does that last part mean? 
Um, then there's different historical things you could look at. You can look that up. I'm not really going to unpack that now because we're running out of time. But here's the thing. Something had happened uh, in, the, in the lives of those Jews because of what they had done to God's people. But here's the thing. When you hear true preaching of word, with the word of God, it will cause you to be a disciple. That's what we read. And it will also bring persecution sometimes. Sometimes it's going to be opposed. When you start living what that preacher's preaching, or you start living what you're studying on your own, somebody's going to get upset. There's going to be opposition. But the last part, wrath has come upon them at last. Now, what that means is that God will take care of his people. When, when God's people are attacked or assailed, there will come a time of retribution. There will come a time. There are people being persecuted all over the world today. And what their persecutors don't know is if they persist, God will deal with them. The Bible says don't get revenge on people because leave vengeance to God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You will be persecuted for your faith. Don't get revenge. Don't try to get them back. Just leave it to God. And God's teaching me this lesson in a personal way that um, not so much persecution but other, other stuff. Anyway, he's saying don't fight this. Let me fight it. Uh, you be still and let God fight the battle because he'll do it. He fights better than you. He can bring the result better than you can. So don't be one of those Christians who's trying to get people back for punishing you, for persecuting you. You step back. And let God do the punishment. Let God bring wrath. And he certainly will. We talk about the love of God and it's so true. One of the greatest expressions of the love of God is his ultimate wrath against evil. God's love brings God's wrath at the end of the age or at the end of the chapter in your life or at the end of the struggle, end of the journey. Wrath comes on those who have attacked God's people. That's why God says in the Psalms, don't touch my anointed. Uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, preaching the gospel and, and sometimes preachers get attacked by Christians, people in the church, because that person doesn't like what the preacher's saying or doesn't like what the pre preacher's doing. And you need to understand, it's okay for you to disagree. It's okay for you to question. But when you attack the honest and clear and faithful preaching of the word, now, I know sometimes leaders get bad and we need to call them to account. I agree with that. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that honest and faithful preacher that you just don't like because they talk about things you don't want them to talk about or they confront you in ways you don't want to be confronted. Then you turn around and you attack that preacher or because they do something in church that leads in a direction you don't want to go. And since you you don't have control anymore, you get mad at that preacher and you want to hurt them. I want you to understand something, that God's got his hand on that preacher. And don't touch God's not anointed and don't do his prophets any harm. It will come back to bite you. Uh, I worry about those people who are proud of the number of preachers they've run off from their churches. I know I know some churches that have a whole string of preachers that have been run off because this one person is in control and in power. And this one person is so proud of all that. I, I don't let them stay around here because I'm in charge around here. And, and I just don't, I don't think you understand. If that's you, I don't think you understand what you're about to face. You need to understand that the wrath of God comes on those who persecute the people of God. That's hard stuff. So how do I know that I've really heard the word of God? It's grounded in the scriptures. It's centered on Jesus Christ. It's faithful. It's true. It's preached in love. It has the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that affects not just my head, but my heart. And it causes me to want to change, to either reject or follow. I mean, I'm going to have a response. The Word of God brings a response. But it also brings about, it's going to bring opposition. There's going to be people that oppose you know, you're going to be called to do things that society doesn't like. But God's going to be with you. And God is going to stand with you. And it, those that attack you, God will deal with them. So you let God deal with the enemy. You let God deal with the opposition. And you stay faithful. Just stay faithful. Stay true. Stay humble. Stay prayerful. Stay obedient. And God will deal with those who trouble you.
Just trust in Him. Be faithful to Him. And make sure we're listening for His voice and grounded in His Word. God bless you. Go in peace.